Hello and welcome to the Science Fiction and Fantasy Marketing Podcast, the show where we help you establish your author brand, increase the size of your audience, and sell more books. I'm Lindsay Baroker, and I'm here with my two co-hosts. I'm Jeff Poole. And I'm Joe Lalo. And we've got our guest returning for you today for the third time. Very few people get invited back three times, but Mark LeFay is a special guy. And he's also a horror author, and he's recently published some nonfiction Killing It on Kobo and the Seven P's of Publishing Success. Uh, you guys may remember he was previously the Director of Author Relations at Kobo, Kobo. Then he struck out on his own to focus on his writing and do consult, some consulting, but he's recently joined forces with the folks at draft to digital So we're going to be asking him a little bit about what's new there. Um, he also has a podcast these days called Stark Reflections, I believe, and uh, he's going to talk about killing it on Kobo and kind of going wide and relying a little less on a, what is it, the largest, the world's largest river store that we shall not name? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Thanks. It is an honor to be back. I'm, uh, I'm honored that I get to come back for a third time and hang out with you guys again. Um, it's been almost two years since you were on. Do you want to... Uh, maybe catch us up a little bit better than I attempted to do in the intro there. You did an absolutely amazing job. Um, in, a, in a nutshell, I left Kobo at the end of last year, at the end of 2017. Uh, I had hired an amazing group of people, uh, Christine Monroe. I'd actually hired her with the intent of having her replace me. Uh, and once, uh, once she was done, uh, her uh, maternity leaves, because in Canada, you take a full year off. I wanted to make sure that the team was in the best hands possible. And, and Christine is indeed a very author friendly uh, centric person from the moment I first interviewed her and, and met her, I knew she was the right person to take over the team. So when she came back and, uh, and I knew that she was back, uh, I knew I could leave uh, the team. So that was a good thing. Uh, I went out to strike out on my own to uh, attempt to write full time, but uh, you know, kind of like the Godfather, they pull you back in. Um, I, I've known the guys from draft to digital for a long, long time. I mean, even when I was working at Kobo, I, I used their free conversion tool because even though I paid a lot of money for the free conversion tool that's built into Kobo writing life, theirs is better. And, uh, and so I'd been using their, their uh, tools uh, for a long time as well as uh, to get into Nook and to iBooks because I was going direct to Kindle and Kobo. And so when I, when I met up with uh, Chris Austin, who's the CEO and I'm sure uh, folks from the podcast know Dan Wood, who's the director of author relations, and Kevin Tumlinson, who is the director of marketing, um, and Aaron uh, Pogue, who's actually uh, the president of the company. They were all at Novelist Sync, and, and we were hanging out together. And, and as I was, I was chatting with Chris, we realized that the synergies um, that existed uh, were there. I realized that I missed being able to build cool things for authors. I was having a great time doing one-on-one -on -one consulting with authors and, you know, working on the books that I've been working on in the last year, because I never had time to write them while I was at Kobo. Um, it all just kind of came to fruition so that at Novelist Sinks, just sort of at the end of September, uh, we realized that there was, um, there was, it was, it was almost like a, you know, going on a, a date, a first date. We realized that there was, there was true love there, um, that, that I respected the stuff that draft digital was doing. And I looked at it as an opportunity to say, okay, I worked for Kobo for six years. I did a, I, I thought I did a decent job building a tool for authors to use to, to leverage their sales on Kobo. Now, uh, especially in the last year, I've been working a lot with authors helping them sell on as many platforms as possible. Now, you know, the easy ones for me at least have been Amazon and Kobo always. Those have always been my highest sales. It's still a little bit more challenging uh, for uh, Apple as well as for Nook. But this was an opportunity for me to, to take my focus from a very single uh, retailer specific focus to a broader one uh, and, and really think about publishing wide in the widest sense. Um, so, so it kind of fit in uh, working uh, as the director of uh, business development at draft to digital allows me to do some of the things I loved at Kobo, which is find partners to work with, um, to help. And uh, it also allows me to look at um, authors and see what we can do to help them on all platforms. And that's one of the things I've been enjoying a lot uh, especially working collaboratively with um, Dan and Kevin mostly on, you know, how can we find more promotional opportunities for authors 
with Kobo, with Apple, with Nook, and of course with Amazon, you know, the inmates run the asylum. So um, <laughs> they're, they're all built in, right? It's, it's AMS ads, basically. Uh, there, there's no real relationships that you have unless you're a seven figure author at Amazon and they're, uh, you know, knocking down your door every second week to try to convince you to become exclusive. <laughs> Okay, that's probably true. But uh, you, you know, there are some people that have reps and uh, they were actually at the 20 books show, one of the guys. But yeah, it's kind of hard to just email them and say, hey, can you promo me? <laughs> Appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. We, got, we all have to figure out different things that work. Um, and I'm curious, if you did some consulting with authors, did you see any common themes of uh, like what people are looking, what help people need right now? I mean, sell more books, I guess, is always kind of the big thing for a lot of us. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, I think the thing. I mean, listeners to this podcast are probably far more advanced um, than a lot of the folks that I've been working with, and and I think so, one of the things that we forget. You guys have been in the industry for a long time. You know what's going on. You talk to the movers and shakers. You're paying attention to all the different strategies that are going on. You're listening to the podcasts. You're engaging at the conferences, etc. Uh, and what I found is that as much as we think that, uh, you know, when you've been doing this for a long, long time, you think, okay, what's the next thing, right? The next thing is going to be audiobooks, it's going to be augmented reality, it's going to be whatever. 90% of authors coming to the table today are, are going, where do I publish my ebook? Like they don't even know that Amazon, Kobo, uh, Apple, and Nook, uh, and, and maybe for some people, Google, you know, the four or five big retailers, they don't even know that. So a lot of what I've been doing with some of the beginning writers is just just introducing them to the landscape. And I think um, in a very David Gogren sense, one of my you know underlying missions is always, please don't let them fall prey to the vultures, um, the, the, the companies uh, that may uh, use the initials AS uh, to, as the master uh, company, that those companies that are out there to, 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 I guess to bleed authors dry, that's their business model, not, not to help them sell books. So, um, but I think uh, marketing is often the thing. I was actually working one-on-one -on -one with a client earlier this week and she said, wow, I thought writing the book was hard. <laughs> and I was like, oh no, no, that was hard. Don't get me wrong, but uh, yeah, understanding the, the marketing, uh, that's a whole other thing. And so I think um, a lot of authors, um, a lot of authors, think that their work is done. Um, and there was that dream. I, I mean, I'm old enough to remember the dream was to, if you could just find an agent or just find a publisher, all your work was done. Well, I mean, I'm traditionally published as well as self-published and, and I do just as much work for my trad pub titles uh, for publicity and marketing. I just, you know, I have no, I have no access to, to the dashboard. So once a year I find out what my sales are not, <laughs> yeah, I don't get paid once. Uh, you know, once a month, I get paid once a year. Uh, so, uh, but I still work really, really hard uh, to try to promote those titles. Right. And it, there's certainly, there's, there've always been the vanity presses, but it feels like there really are a lot more uh, things out there right now. People are trying to take advantage of the gold rush by selling the shovels and pickaxes. And it, it is hard for folks. There are some really valuable courses out there that can really be a game changer if you're ready for them. Do you have any advice for uh, folks on how to suss out? I mean, I say look up who's selling the course, right? Are they selling any fiction? That's a, that's a really good, yeah. Having success? <laughs> uh, it's a really good way. And, and I think here's the funny thing. And, and this, is the, this is the most wonderful thing. You look at um, the courses that somebody like Mark Dawson, who's obviously doing quite well, is selling. He shares a lot of information for free on podcasts and webinars. And, uh, you know, uh, Brian Meeks will do the same thing when it comes to AMS ads or Nick Stevenson with your newsletter. Um, you don't have to immediately spend the money. And, and here's what I've, what I've sort of found is that sometimes, depending on the type of personality and the, and the way that you learn, sometimes you need to go through a six-hour intensive course and you have to see everything line by line by line. And that's just the way you learn and you're better off that way. Other people can listen to it, uh, you know, in a one-hour interview get everything they need, and they're good to go. So, so there's no one way of doing it. And I found that for the most part, the ones with integrity, the ones who are there to actually pay it forward and help do provide a lot of incredible valuable content up front. Um, and maybe that, that would be considered the Reader's Digest version 
of the content. Like here it is in a nutshell, the six things you need to do. Now, if, if you want for this price, I'll go through it and I'll take six hours explaining it to you. And I'll show you example after example. Um, and so I think, I think the ones with integrity don't try to keep everything behind a paywall. Um, they maybe keep the long details and the depth behind the paywall. And for me, um, that usually lets me know whether or not it's a, a scam where they're just trying to get my money or they're actually providing a different level of value for those people who really need to dig into the details. Yeah, that's a good tip. And I, th I think people that are very confident about the information they have and the value of it are very open about sharing, you know, and we're lucky that a lot of people in this community just put it all out there. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, you don't get that in, in very many other communities, right? Like the, the independent author community is just so amazing in that uh, people share, um, you know, what works for them, what doesn't work for them. And, and it's always going to be unique for each individual. But yeah, that's, that's a really powerful thing. We have, a, we have an amazing community. Uh, I know you go to a lot of conferences and talk to a lot of authors. So I'm wondering here, as we're recording this in December of 2018, and I'm trying to remember to put the date in because I've been requested by people to they like say when we're recording stuff. Um, but how do you think the industry is doing right now? You know, a lot of people are saying it's really saturated. Do you feel there's still a lot of opportunities? Um, and do authors need to be a lot smarter now to sell books? Uh, well, I think, uh, yeah, it's different than, you know, five years ago, you could publish any piece of crap and use paint to make a cover and not even have an optimal blurb and, and you know, you'd be <laughs> good to go. Uh, that's not the case now. Uh, but that's okay. And that's only because uh, I think enough uh, readers had been bitten by the, oh, I have to be careful what I buy because I, I bought something for 99 cents and, and it wasn't a deal. <laughs> it was a waste of my time. Um, I honestly believe that we still, I know people talk about the golden days of, you know, the Kindle gold rush and all those things. We're not even, we're not even at the golden days of digital publishing yet. When you actually look at the stats, and this is an interesting thing to pause and consider, go to uh, a, a place like an airport or a bus station or a mall, not a writer's conference, and ask the average person, uh, when was the last time they read a book? And you'll find, you know, one in every hundred people who's actually read a book, uh, ask them uh, how they've read the book. And you'll probably get, you know, 75% of those people are probably going to say uh, it's going to be uh, some sort of paper dead tree version. Um, we are ingrained in the digital publishing environment. What we forget regularly is that the majority of people who have actually read books have never even read an ebook yet. We're still at the tipping point of the publishing industry. And yeah, it's a saturated market. And when you look at the growth statistics, when I joined Kobo and the sales year over year were 600% year over year, well, it was 600% of a smaller number. Now that the numbers are so giant, that 1% or 2% increase is still more significant than the 600% was five years ago. So uh, when you look at some of the stats that say that digital is slowing down, it is slowing down in terms of some growth, but there's still so much more. Uh, there's so much more opportunity that lies ahead uh, of us. And as you said, it does require publishers and authors and uh, as we move forward, authors are publishers and that the, the blending and the blurring of those lines is really beautifully, uh, is not something you can distinguish uh, any longer. Um, you have to become smarter. You have to recognize the same things that held true when I started uh, wanting to first sell my stories to a publisher because that was the only option that there was back in, back in the day. Um, but you, you have to really think about the target uh, market and focusing on the reader. Um, and, and sometimes we lose sight of that in all of our marketing efforts. And that's usually where we go wrong. Now, uh, like, as you say, like, whereas we may not be even into the golden age, the, 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 gold, the gold rush at the very beginning certainly has uh, tapered off. And as you say, like, it's not as easy to get eyes on your book anymore. But something I've been curious about is whether or not it's harder to keep fans these days because there are so many more options and lots of the really crappy books have been sort of washed out, or rather the authors of the crappy books have been washed out and aren't putting crappy books up anymore. So, uh, like, is the general, like, increase of quality making it harder to have a loyal fan base? 
Well, I think one of the things that makes it hard to have a loyal fan base is the way that we are affecting the industry. So when you think about the uh, the reading industry, and, and, and this is a thing that happens to me all the time because I'm on planes all the time, and I'll often sit beside somebody who has a book, and I, I can't help it. If they have a Kindle or a Kobo or a hardcover, I usually ask them what they're reading because I'm a book nerd. That's what I do. Um, and half the time, it's like a Lee Child book, for example. Uh, and I will say, uh, oh, you, you like Lee Child? And they go, yeah, but it's too bad he only puts out one book a year. And that has always been the standard in our industry. You know, Stephen King, well, and sometimes he puts out two books a year now. Uh, but there's usually a book a year. And what's happened is I've known people who are thriller readers, who are horror readers, who are romance readers, who are contemporary fiction readers, who read, you know, three books a week. Um, those are the readers who have to uh, move on to the next thing. And, and so as the indie author community has advanced and recognized that, oh my God, if I do a rapid release, that means that I can, uh, I can satisfy those readers who are, or, uh, you know, uh, avarice readers who want to read more books. So in the old style of releasing a book and then waiting a year and releasing another book, that may not be as effective as it used to be because by the time that your second book comes out, that reader may have gone on to discover 12 other <laughs> authors in the meantime, because they read so much. Um, and, and even times uh, a lot of uh, avid readers don't even know the title or the name of the author they're reading. They latch onto it, they start to read a series, and they talk about it, and they love it, and they're like, oh, I can't remember who wrote it, but it was this great series of 12 books. That, so they're spending all this money, uh, but they still may not know who the brand is. And that's even worse uh, in a digital society, because, you know, um, I know this is, uh, this is audio, but, you know, looking at the video feed as we're talking, you look behind me, there's thousands of books in, in this house, because I'm a, a giant book nerd. I have even more books on the Kobo device that's, you know, right on my desk. I have way more books on this. There's, see, there's a book on uh, mastering Amazon ads um, <laughs> on my Kobo. But uh, I have more books on that device, but I, I never see them. Uh, so I don't even pay attention half the time. I'm just reading it either for information or I'm reading it for entertainment. Whereas when I walk by on the shelves and I, and I run my finger along the books, I can, um, I can uh, recognize, oh, that was a Michael Connolly novel that I read as opposed to, oh, that was a thriller from some author who I met at a conference and their book sounded good, so I bought it and I can't remember what their name is. Um, so that happens uh, where my consumption might have gone up, but my retention of who I'm reading might have gone down, and that makes the play on author branding a little bit more tricky in this new world. All right, so let me ask you something too. How important is it for an author to stay in contact with your readers or fans? I mean, does having a presence in social on social media help or hinder today's authors, do you think? Uh, it, it really depends on the author's comfort level with that. If you're not comfortable doing something, it's going to show and it's going to be obvious to the fans. If you are comfortable with it, I really would advise, you know, the, the very least some sort of newsletter. So at the very, very least, even if you're not comfortable sending out a monthly or, or, or you know, every two weeks or something like that, giving them some updates, um, is, uh, is letting them know when your next book comes out. I, I mean, that's, that's a valuable thing to do, but I think, um, this goes back to um, when I was a bookseller, one of the things that was the most powerful thing that I could do as a bookseller was when I was speaking to a customer about a book, if I could make the author human in the eyes of, of, the, uh, of the book customer, if I suddenly made that, uh, that person a three-dimensional person, that turned it into a sale a lot more quickly. And, and, and I would, you know, you, you would talk about putting the product in the customer's hand, but I would uh, oftentimes, because I, you know, I'd been in the industry for a long, long time, an author would come through the store and if I had an interesting conversation with them and they would share something with me or I went to an event and I heard them or I was listening to them on a podcast, when I was talking to the customer, I would say, did you know that, you know, John Smith, when he wrote this scene, wrote this scene based on his grandmother's house, which is, you know, an hour from here. And it's, it was a cottage on the lake and he, he spent every summer there and that's where the scene came from. So suddenly what I, what, I, what I did in that case is that author was not just a name on a piece of paper. That author was a real living person who lived in the same space and operated in the same space as that person I was talking to because they knew the lake I was talking about. So 
when you as an author interact on social media, whether you respond to a tweet or you're posting interesting things, uh, Instagram about your dogs, for example, about what, you know, what it's like for them having recently moved or, or whether it's, um, this is a really fascinating uh, thing. Think about Joanna Penn and doing the research on her tombstones because she likes to write and uh, Jeff Penn likes to write about those macabre things, um, sharing some of her travel uh, photos. That's the kind of thing that gives the reader that connection to the real human behind the uh the book because um in other celebrity guises you you can easily think of movie stars and and musicians but in the book industry the author is usually a lot more hidden uh i don't know if you remember those old american express ads. was it american express never leave home without it was it do you remember when stephen king was on one of those he was one of the most popular author in the world at the time but nobody knew what he looked like. <laughs> so, so there's this real opportunity we have as authors now that people can know what we look like. They can know that, you know, I like craft beer. They can know that, you know, um, uh, Joanna Penn likes to, to, to wander through graveyards whenever she visits a new city. You know, they can know interesting things about us that may relate somehow to our writing or not, or they just may, uh, they might just make us three-dimensional. And, and I, I think that's valuable because I've seen it firsthand for years. That's a really interesting point about like the physical books just being so much more memorable. And like, cause you know, I can think of books I love and you carried it around for weeks so you can see the cover in your head and you're right on your Kindle, you know, you kind of glance at the cover when you buy it and then you never see it again. And you, I can see why, especially the Kindle unlimited kinds of readers that are just going through stuff really forget you. And, um, but to Jeff's question, I, I do think social media is, is a way to help, like you were saying, uh, establish your author brand and really become a fixture in people's minds. I've, you know, I've got like one series of dragons in it, but out of whatever, 50 books and a pen name and everything. But I, I've posted enough things on Facebook with like dragon snow sculptures and ice sculptures and things that now people email me, my readers, anytime they see a dragon, you know, quirky, I've, I've got enough fire, was it a fire pit dragon emailed to me, you know, and all these things. So I, at least <laughs> they're thinking of me and fantasy and dragons and hopefully remembering me that way. Well, they've made that connection and they're reaching out to you because they see something that is part of your brand or part of one of the thing, one of the many things that you write and they identify you. They see it. They think of Lindsay Broker. I mean, that is brilliant. That's powerful. I get a lot of people on, on Facebook, for example, because I, you know, I've got Barnaby, the skeleton behind me in New York on the other side, I, you know, it's, skulls and stuff like that are fascinating to me so all the time anyone anytime someone sees a skeleton cartoon or joke or whatever it's always shared to my site um uh, to my personal stuff it doesn't mean they're going to read my books ever but it's it's it, at least at least that part of my brain is working if i could kind of parlay that into the selling more books that would be awesome but again think about that connection that they saw something and thought of you because of something you've written that's that's brilliant I guess that's the way we have to do it now in the digital age when <laughs> very few people are getting hard copies of our books. So um, you have the Killing It for Kobo book out, so we should probably ask a, a couple questions about that. Uh, we had you on the show before when you were the Kobo guy, and we've had Chrissy on the show since then. So we've heard some tips, but maybe you could go over some of the, the basic stuff that uh, m- you know we need to be doing there to sell books. Um, it's, it's funny. It doesn't matter how many times I say this, it almost always feels like it's new, um, is don't forget that, um, Kobo is a lot stronger in countries outside of the U S therefore you really have to pay attention to the global pricing at the very minimum, pay attention to your Canadian, your, uh, uh, GBP, uh, so like in the UK, your euros, Australian and New Zealand dollars at the very least, you need to pay attention to those. And then you also have to think about the way that Kobo's partnerships operate in different countries um, that are different, right? So Kobo doesn't sell print books, but they partner in Canada with, with Chapters Indigo that does sell print books. And they partner with Bowl in the Netherlands that, um, you know, is a major retailer there. So I think just remembering that it's not about the U S and Kobo, you know, I mean, you can be number one on Kobo in the U S by selling half a dozen copies of something. (laughs) You can't get 
to that number uh, in Canada the same way because the volume is that much higher, even though Canada is significantly a smaller country than the U.S. So I think that's one of the things. The other thing to remember about Kobo is that it's very much because it was born out of a, a retailer. It was born out of a physical bricks and mortar retail environment originally. And most of the people who work at Kobo are book nerds from the book environment. Um, you know, going to size Michael Tamblin, who, you know, was, I think he was, he was running Indigo's first website. Um, and Indigo is, is one of the major chains in, in Canada today. Uh, and, you know, working at an independent bookstore. Um, a, a lot of the, the, the blood in Kobo is, is merchandise based. So it's not just about the algorithms. They do have some strong algorithms working in the background, but they have book people there. Nathan Maharaj, the head of merchandising, is very much a book guy. He is, you'll never not find him with a book in his hand. It's a Kobo, obviously, but he's always reading. And you're walking to the, to the restroom, going to the coffee machine, he's got a book in his hand. The guy never stops reading. And the, the entire team of merchandisers is like that. And so when you, have, when you think about uh, when you think about uh, selling on places like Kobo and even Nook, because Nook is tied into um, Barnes and Noble, think about um, the person behind uh, making that decision rather than the algorithm making that decision. It's a fundamental change in all of the other, um, you know, marketing, like 90% of the marketing advice out there is how to put in your keywords and optimize this and search for it and stuff like that, as opposed to, well, you know, sales reps come in and pitch titles to these guys. That's a completely different model. And it's completely the model I grew up in, in, in book selling, where I sat down with sales reps and they told me, here's our catalog and here are the books you should pay attention to. So, uh, I mean, you know, one of the things I'm doing with Dan Wood at draft to digital is we're looking at how can we pitch titles that we know are coming up yeah, in, in, in the future uh, in a way that will appeal to the different, you know, the, the Kobos of the world, the iBooks of the world, the Nooks of the world. Um, and, and I think that's a little bit different because we can get a book ready and make it live immediately, right? You get it back from your editor, everything's good to go. Traditional publishers um, will, will do a lead time of as much as six months. The book is ready to go, but they have their longer marketing plan. And so I, I've been even uh, finding some of the authors that I've been working with in the last little while. Um, you know, one of the authors I'm working with now is looking at uh, a March or an April release, even though the book's ready to go now, because all of the marketing efforts that we're going to be working on for this new book are going to be the buildup for that in a very similar way to the way that the, um, uh, traditional publishers would do that when, you know, the sales reps and the appearances and here's the sales package that you're going to send to the various um, merchandisers. So, you know, yeah, Amazon, it's about the keywords and it's about the AMS ads and stuff like that. And so once the pre-order's up, you can start doing some stuff there. Uh, but how are you going to appeal? How are you going to uh, create a story behind this book that is going to catch the attention of a human who's responsible for putting that in the front window of that uh, digital store? All right. All right. Now, um, I, I had a question, but I think I'm massage it a little bit because I think this is more interesting to me. Um, the, uh, I've been wide since the beginning, but a lot of people uh, these days are starting off um, exclusive to Amazon. So they might have had some measure of success or lack of success in Amazon for a while before they end up going to Kobo or any other storefronts how likely is it that it's going to feel like a fresh start there, like an untouched audience versus how, how many people who shop there also shop on Amazon and you're nothing new to them? Uh, the chances are they're not, they're not the same customers. There might be a bit of crossover. I mean, I, I browse on Amazon and then I go buy it on Kobo. Why? Cause I own a Kobo device and most of my libraries in Kobo. Yeah. I have a few books from Kindle, but to be quite honest, sometimes if, if it's only available on Amazon, I just don't buy the book, even if I really want to buy it. Um, you are starting fresh, for sure. And uh, I think there was one, there's very few exceptions to the rule, but most authors, it really honestly takes on Kobo, it takes a good six months to nine months or longer before that you start to see that growth. There's no immediate, like, you know, blast. Uh, T.S. Paul, I don't know what he did or how he did it, uh, like, but when he showed me his sales after one month on Kobo, I was like, 
no, you're lying to me. You've been on Kobo for a year, right? So, I mean, there are always exceptions to the rule, but for the most part, when you publish wide, when you're looking at the other platforms, it really does take a long, long time. And, and the thing I've discovered, I've been wide with, you know, 95% of my titles for most of my publishing um, career as an author. And I'll find for some reason, this one title sells on Nook in the US. I don't know why <laughs> I'm not doing anything to promote it, but that one picked up. This other one's selling on Amazon in the UK. God knows why I'm not doing anything to promote it. Uh, this other one's selling on Kobo in Canada or Australia. Um, and, 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 and again, uh, a lot of these things just happen uh, organically. Um, the challenge with us as authors is anytime we see things like that, we want to try and replicate it and say, well, what, what happened to, uh, to make that book sell? And um, I think maybe I've been lucky that I've been in the publishing industry long enough that I've seen, I think, well, in the last 25 plus years, I've seen vampires be in and then out and then in it and then out. Right. So Anne Rice was huge. In, in my early days of book selling with an uh, interview with a vampire, which is probably ancient history uh, for most people now. And then vampires were out again. And then they came back in with sort of Suki Stackhouse and some of those uh, books. And then they went back out again. And then they came back in again with Twilight. And then they came with a different kind of vampire. Um, and so there was a lot of resurgences. E even when Dracula was remade, um, uh, you know, uh, the certain movies are made based on some of the classics that bring certain characters back. So I do know that the trends within publishing are constantly changing and some of the, and some of the trends um, will be in your favor, but only be in certain countries, right? Um, when you guys think about the, um, uh, the global market, and I'm sure if you're paying attention to uh, Joanna Penn or, or uh, Mark Williams from the new publishing standard, you are aware that, you know, over in Europe, uh, there's a lot of countries that, you know, eBooks is, is a way smaller percentage because there's a lot more going on in, in print and they, it hasn't caught on the way it has in the U S and even in the UK. So that's something, um, um, that, that's something, um, that I think is uh, pertinent as well. All right. So let me ask you, do you have any idea what Kobo is doing to try and distance themselves from Amazon? I mean, is there anything our viewers would be interested in learning about Kobo that, and how it sells books? Because I had a, a friend ask me this once and I did this. I don't know. So I figured this would be a good time to ask. <laughs> well, I think the key one, and they've been doing this from day one. Uh, I admired Kobo before I went to join Kobo. Uh, and, and I admire them after I've left Kobo. And I even admired them inside of Kobo. Um, Kobo never tried to fight against the other players in the market. Kobo wanted to partner with them. So in every single market they moved into, they didn't look to dominate the market. They looked to bring their strengths and partner with a retailer. That's a significantly different approach than Amazon has. I'll now, say. In, right? In the U.S., they recently partnered with Walmart. Okay, let's see what happens there. But you have to remember that the Walmart shopper um, may or may not be a, a Kindle shopper already. There might be some overlap there. Obviously, you're looking for deals um, on Walmart. Uh, you're looking for deals online on, on, on Kindle. That could be an entirely new demographic of people. Um, the, the indie author market in the U.S. are probably not buying books on, on Amazon. They're buying books at their local independent bookstore. And Kobo's had a partnership with the, um, the American Booksellers Association. So there's 600 independent bookstores there when you buy uh, an ebook from that bookstore you're actually buying it from Kobo and that bookstore is getting credited for those sales so they don't lose the customer they're actually making money doing nothing which was my favorite way to make money uh, when I was an independent bookseller and I had uh, my store closed at, at night um, and, and I had online sales happening while I was in, uh, in bed and I wasn't paying for rent and I wasn't paying for staff to be in the store that's my favorite thing right like that's brilliant um so uh, i think that's one uh, thing that kobo does differently kobo also recognized that the u.s was uh dominated by amazon uh going up against uh you know uh, david going up against goliath in in that arena was probably not a good idea so they spent a ton of time and effort uh, forging relationships in other countries bull in the netherlands is significantly powerful uh, as a huge retailer, uh, actually, and you think about Tolino, Kobo bought Tolino, which is Amazon sized in Germany. So the market is about 50% uh, Amazon in Germany. 
and 50% Tolino, r- roughly, uh, give or take. And uh, even though uh, Tolino is owned by Kobo, actually the, the best way for indie authors to get into uh, um, Tolino is through draft to digital uh, Kobo doesn't even have a way to do that. And one of the reasons Kobo did that is Tolino was a trusted brand that was built by the booksellers in Germany. And Kobo came in and said, we love this company. We love what you're doing. So they purchased the company, but they manage it from a distance and they let the people at Tolino do what they're doing best because they know that business really, really well, better than Kobo does. And so that's, again, a different way of approaching it. So Tolino is still uh, a, a huge success story owned by Kobo and yet managed by the people who love and care about books in that industry. And that, again, is a, a huge differ, differentiating uh, factor uh, that kind of, I mean, I'm, I'm a book nerd, so I'm always going to, to fall back to the fact that, well, book people are the best people, aren't they? Uh, so when they make decisions that's based on the culture and based on the community and based on what's going on there, that, to me, uh, makes a significant difference in a company that's not just about, okay, we'll get you in by selling you a book at a loss as a loss leader. And then we're going to sell you a, a refrigerator. You mentioned, um, the Walmart deal, and I know this is kind of after you left Kobo, but I'm curious if you've heard, heard if any authors are, are doing well over there. Cause I haven't, I heard they wouldn't list the free books and all my book ones are free series starters. So I just kind of not even been worrying about it until, you know, yeah. if I hear somebody's really like killing it, then maybe I'll look at the <laughs> prices on, on book one. So at least get them listed in the store. Well, ironically, I, I mean, I knew, I knew Walmart was coming. There's just a lot of things you can't talk about and still <laughs> because, because of, you know, agreements that you've made to not discuss things. Uh, so I was uh, really excited when that finally happened. Um, but again, uh, in my mind, and again, I'm not there and I'm not there to advise, but okay, so Walmart won't list books for free because that's their decision as a retail part. Just like some retailers, you know, some uh, DNR, for example, in, in, in Turkey is not going to list anything that has, um, uh, you know, nudity or erotica or anything like that involved because that's their mandate as a retailer. But I would look towards, uh, I would look towards those books and th- this would just be me sort of advice that I would give to my colleagues at Kobo and say, all right, so take those free books and, and do the same sort of thing. You know, Amazon won't let you make it free, but make it 99 cents. If it's free, let, let, the, let the publishers and authors know your free books on walmart.com and in, in, in Amazon, or in Amazon, in, in walmart.com in the U.S. are going to be 99 cents. I'm sorry, we're going to have to give you your 45 cents every time you sell one. Um, but at the very least, it's something that Walmart could use. It's something that authors and publishers could use as a funnel. So yeah, your regular books are three, two, three, or four ninety nine. Uh, your first book is a buck. So it's a different strategy, but at least it's there and visible, right? So that would be something I would be fighting for. I can't speak on behalf of uh, of Kobo, but again, as a as a as a sort of a person who's very interested in wanting to see Kobo and Nook and Apple and Google, I want to see them all successful because I want there to be choice for authors. Uh, I'm more than happy to (laughs) to share what I think would be a good idea to help authors sell more on those other platforms. Again, Walmart's early days. Um, uh, I don't know if you've seen some of the displays when I was at um, Novelist Inc. in Florida, because again, we don't have Walmart US here in Canada. We have Walmart Canada and the deal is not in Canada. So uh, when I was in the States, I went to a Walmart and, and I found pictures, uh, I took pictures and I shared pictures of the cool little cards. And I was delighted to see of the 20, 30 cards that were on display, there were four or five indie authors, uh, you know, several that I knew. And I was so excited to see that. Uh, and again, it's a small thing. And, and it, it's actually something I saw five or six years ago in the industry that was probably too early. And now it's come back again at, at that physical presence of eBooks. Because I think at Christmas time, uh, you go and you buy a card because Walmart still has greeting cards, right? And then you go and you buy, oh my God, there's a box set of these fantasy stories that I can get and I can put it in a card and I can buy a Kobo and I can give it to Aunt Selma who loves reading uh, fantasy novels with dragons uh, in them. And suddenly I can do that. Or if I didn't see a book that I want, I bought her a Kobo from Walmart and I bought the gift card. So there's this new opportunity that last Christmas you never had and now you do 
uh, and and I'm and I'm really I've got my fingers crossed that this works out really really well for authors, for publishers, for Walmart, and for Kobo because I think it's a great it's a great opportunity to expand in a market that we think is already so, sewn up, right? We think the U.S. is sewn up and it's a done deal, um, but I, I really think that uh, as the as the industry grows and changes, we can condition more people to to check out the great the the, the benefit of reading ebooks, uh, and maybe maybe some of those are Walmart shoppers. It would be interesting if it is a different possible route to get in because I do feel like a lot of Walmart people are like anti Amazon people. They're sort of like, I don't know, little wrestlers going at it down here. You're loyal to Walmart instead of Amazon and vice versa. The Hatfields and the McCoys, maybe? Maybe so. Um, so I've heard a lot of people say lately that have maybe left KU, KDP Select, and tried to go wide, that they're they're hearing and experiencing that it's kind of tough unless you can regularly get BookBub ads to do well in the other stores. And I, I certainly can't deny that my revenue goes up a lot whenever I get a box set featured on BookBub on all those other stores. Do you think that's true, or are people doing okay without dropping a lot of money for ads? Uh, I think that's one of the, it's one of the most guaranteed investments, right? You know, if you get a book bub, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to get a deal. Um, I have heard rumblings that um, they don't work as effectively as they used to. I've heard that some of the secondary or, or third level um, um, sites don't always work consistently. There, there may be, uh, there may be a bit of uh, changes to the market, but it's, it's really, really funny. Um, there are, and this kind of goes back to the twenty books to fifty k mentality, and and the thought of that is that if you have enough product out there, um, even without doing it, I'm not saying just assuming you're doing no marketing. If you're selling an average of a book a week, and you have one book. And suddenly you have 10 books and you're selling an average of a book of each book a week that suddenly your revenue goes up. I have seen evidence through both Kobo and through draft to digital that there are authors who aren't getting book bubs every month who are doing significantly well because they're consistently putting out good products that their readers want. They're slowly building their reader base and the readers know that they can stay with them and that they're going to get the next book. Um, yeah, BookBub is like a lottery ticket win, right? Um, uh, getting a, a bargain booksy or an e-reader news today um, can give you some lift and some benefit. It's just one of the many things that you chug along in the background. Sometimes very successfully leveraging your AMS ads can get your sales up, uh, especially on Kobo. If you can get a promo with Kobo either through the, the stuff that's being done through draft digital or Smashwords, or if you're direct with Kobo through Kobo writing life, if you get a through usually those 30% off promos work really, really well. If you can get one of those chances are your Kobo sales go up. And sometimes it's just that extra kick in the pants you need to, to start to get your books up to that next slightly higher plateau. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I, I still know that there are authors who are, chugging along, they have a free first book in series, or if they're not writing series books, I even know authors who have only written standalones, but they still use like a, a single title that is their free loss leader. And then, you know, you know, for every thousand downloads, they gain two new readers who go and buy all their other books. Uh, again, it's a long-term uh, slow uh, slog. Um, the one thing that has never been true about this industry and I doubt will ever be true is there will never be a single magic bullet <laughs> that's going to guarantee you anything, even, even a book bub, right? A book bub, you know, uh, I've, I've had friends who've run book bubs who are like, well, I spent $800 and I made 850. Okay. You know, it doesn't always, it's not always magic. Uh, sometimes it works. Sometimes it doesn't work so much. Yeah, it's true. Uh, and speaking of you're talking about uh, funneling people back to a loss leader, uh, like that's standard wisdom is that's the thing you do if you're a series writer. You have you funnel people back and you try to get them to filter through the entire series. But something I've been uh, I've been realizing more and more as each of my series gets longer and longer is sometimes it's really hard to make your readers aware that new books have released in those series. All of your marketing muscle is going back to book one. But unless you're being like, how do you make sure that people know? Like, hey, that series you read two years ago, there are three more books in it now. Uh, you should go read those too. 
That is that is tricky. You are right. And that's where your author uh, newsletter or your, your engagement with the community, if there's a, a group where they follow you, you know, um, that's where that comes into play. Um, that uh, unfortunately, that that's going to happen all the time, though. It's always going to happen. Yeah, uh, you are gonna you're gonna have people forget about you for, and it may be for a while. The, the 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 benefit, and this is the weird things that you sometimes see in your dashboard, where you suddenly go, "Wait a second! It looks like I sold one of every book." Um, you know, I haven't had any sales, and all of a sudden, one day I sold one of every book. It was like that was probably that reader three years ago who loved your stuff and went, "Oh yeah, Joe's t- t- books." I, I I oh cool. It, it's kind of funny how that happens. Something triggered them, uh, you know, uh, and they they remembered. Uh, I'll give you a perfect example. I've been a bookseller for a long, long time. I would get advanced readers' copies or ARCs from publishers all the time. I'd get them, I'd take them, I'd put them on, put them on the shelf. There was one time I picked up an, a, a title, and and I, and I was just sitting there, and I looked at it, and I went, no, I've never read that book. And I pulled it off the shelf, and I realized I got it 10 years earlier. This book had been sitting on my shelf for 10 years. I got it for free, and I hadn't even read it yet. And I opened it up, and I went, Oh my God, this guy is brilliant. And I went out and I bought every single other book the guy ever had. And I was so upset because there's still two of them that were out of print. And I've only been able to get one of them since then. But it was one of those things uh, that happened. So one of the things that I, you know, when I was at Kobo, I was trying to convince the marketing team to do to say, we have stats that show you somebody downloaded a book for free, but they never opened it. And one of the things retailers are constantly trying to do is trying to prevent churn and say, okay, you haven't bought a book in a while. What, what, what can we send the email to do entice you to buy a book? What I was saying is how about people who haven't read a book and have downloaded free books? Don't try to sell them anything. Try to get them to read the books that they've read. You know, what marketing could be done to say, Hey Joe, you've got these three books and here are some great reviews for these three books that are already in your library. All we want you to do is read them because I know, cause I've seen the stats at Kobo that if, if they read that book one in that series and they actually get through to the end, there's a 50% chance they're going to buy book two. So I think marketing on the retailer level needs to become a little bit more sophisticated to take advantage of that. Um, I know Kobo does that already, right? Uh, I get email because I'm a Kobo reader. So I get Kobo emails all the time that say, um, uh, if you've entered your series metadata properly, and I'm t- not talking about putting it in the title like that bullshit that you have to do on Amazon. But on Kobo, uh, you can actually enter your metadata properly where you put the series name and the volume number. And when you do that, the Kobo automated system algorithms will automatically send an email to let people know who have read free book one or downloaded it to their library to let them know that book two is available. So even enhancing your metadata and making sure it's as accurate and and as clean as possible. I know that's not a sexy thing to think about the retailers as they get smarter like that, like Kobo are going to constantly be reminding customers about that next book. So, uh, you know, how, how do they find out that you have book eight in that series out? That's how <laughs> you know, all the people who have book seven will get a notification. Um, and again, uh, what I do when I get those is I, if I know the author, I usually forward them the email and say, Hey, look what I just got. I just got a recommendation to read your next book. Uh, because you know, I, I, I like to, uh, I like to see that uh, sort of thing myself and understand what's going on in the background that we're not even aware of. So along those same lines, when an author releases a new title in an ongoing series, usually, any and all advertising is focused on the newest release. How much, if any, advertising dollars should be focused on previous titles in the series? I remember some stats we had looked at uh, when I was at Kobo where as, um, uh, about, and this is where you've got the six month lead time for a new title is usually about two to three months before the new release in the series, you start banging on the earlier books in that series. And that has an effect because you start to bring in new people who then so, you know, you finish, and, 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 and again, this may be more linked to traditional publishing where you finish a book and you got to wait a year <laughs> for the next book from that author for, or in that series. But in this particular case, it's, we know the book is coming out in September. So over the summer, we're going to start banging on, on the earlier books in the series so that we can get more people into the series so that when the next book comes out, it's more immediate. It's like they just finished book five and book six is coming out. The other thing you guys should uh, pay attention to, and I've, and I've seen Carlin uh, Robertson from um, BookBub 
do this presentation at Novelist Sync uh, and again at uh, 20 books to 50K, make sure you're leveraging. Uh, BookBub has the free tool as an author. Whether or not you can get a BookBub or not, if you've ever applied and you've done stuff or you've done ads on BookBub, go in and enhance your author data there. Uh, you know, there's there's notifications for, for new releases through BookBub. Draft to digital, we've got the new uh, carousels uh, that exist there. There's notifications that you can get. It was so cool. I, I got notified because uh, I have a, a few different accounts because I, I managed uh, an account for a good friend of mine. And uh, I got notified that one of my books was coming out from draft to digital on his account, which I thought was kind of cool because he really should read me. But, uh, but it was just kind of, but, but again, it was based on, it was based on using the books to read uh, platform for that, um, which is a universal link to all retailers, not just, not just Amazon. Um, so I think leveraging some of those places and even making sure, I mean, obviously your author central profile, uh, on Amazon uh, and uh, making sure your Goodreads uh, titles are all there. Because again, you never know where the customers are going to discover you. If they're a Kobo reader, they're going to look for it on Kobo. If they're a Amazon reader, they're going to look for it on Amazon. If they're uh, uh, a book lover uh, and you don't know where they're reading from, they, they may discover it on Goodreads. So those are some of the things um, to think about. All of those little things can add up and, and slowly increase your SEO um, over time. Right. The uh, gold standard, I guess, is to get them onto your email list because, of course, then you can tell them about the subsequent books in the series. But there are always going to be people who are just not into the email thing. And you may be able to get them to follow you on BookBub because they are signed up there or on Amazon. So I figure, you know, why not mention that, you know, hey, by the way, you can follow me here and here. And you never know which one choice. will get to them. Yeah. And that's it, too. People get so much email that maybe they missed your author newsletter, but hey, they got today's book bub, uh, new release from so on. You're, you, the author. <laughs> exactly. That, and that, that is the case. They, maybe they, they wanted to hear from you, but they missed it. And it went into their spam folder and they didn't catch it. So being available on all the platforms, maybe sometimes having that ad right? Sometimes just boosting the post, sometimes just sharing the Instagram post saying, oh, I'm so excited. The, my book's out today. You're not, nothing more than you're happy that it's out, not go buy my book or, hey, everyone go check it out. Sometimes those subtle reminders do it. I mean, that's why I use Barnaby for that all the time, right? He's holding one of my books or something like that. And it's a cheeky joke. It's this subtle reminder that I have a book that's spooky. Uh, and it's not a, hey, everyone go buy my book. I oftentimes I won't even put a link to the book. It's just that sort of subtle reminder. It kind of comes back to Jim Bain said this, the uh, science fiction publisher, that uh, your, your book cover is a billboard. Uh, and this goes back to that seven points of contact. And this is why sometimes those, uh, those certain ads on Amazon work where you, you drop in a hundred bucks and, and it's just kind of chugging along and no one's doing anything, but it's that constant, <laughs> the more they see it, the more they might click on it the sixth or seventh time they actually see it. So you never know, um, like Lindsay said, you never know where it is that they saw the book um, that, that was the tipping point for, uh, for clicking that buy button. Well, now that you're at draft to digital we should talk a little bit about that, I suppose. And um, you, I presumably see the data now, not just for like what books are selling at Kobo, but what people are doing on Google Play and Apple. Is there anything that you're seeing that um, authors are doing to find some success on, on these other stuff? I know this is going to sound basic and you don't want to hear the basics, right? But the single biggest impact that an author can have uh, for selling on all the platforms is actually including all the platforms. And actually when you go to their author website and all you find is a link to Amazon, I, it used to frustrate me to no end when I was at Kobo. Um, and, and, and I, and I, 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 I mentioned books to read.com and I really think that's a powerful tool. I started using it as an author uh, a year or two ago when, when, whenever it was launched because I was getting tired uh, of having my Amazon version and my Kobo version and my whatever version, my whatever version. And, and now I just have uh, to um, uh, put in a, a single link that will take you to, if you have a retailer of your choice, it'll take you right to the retailer or it'll take you to a landing page where you can see all the retailers you can buy it from. I know it's a simple thing, but being inclusive of all the retailers is step one. 
Yeah, and I've actually, I started using books to read too the last year or two. And even though I'm launching new series into Amazon, into KDP Select to take advantage of the, all the KU juice, you know, after nine months or whatever, when it runs out, I put things wide and I've started to finally learn, you know, it takes a while to, to learn these things, but to use a books to read link right from the beginning. And then later, I don't have to go back to my website and find all the places where I just link to Amazon. Sure. And then later you just you know, tell it to go out and find all the, the other links to your book. Yeah, you can use it just for Amazon, uh, which is brilliant. I love that. Uh, and it just, just to give you guys a bit of an insight, we are working on ways to give authors more analytics on what's happening there. Right now, when you go to your uh, Universal Book Links uh, link, you see the top three retailers that people click on. Well, there's more than three there. Uh, so we are working on ways to bring you more analytics that so you can understand, okay, someone went to your books to read page what did they do you know what are some of the other uh, pieces of data and if you guys have ideas on what kind of data you'd like to see by all means email help at draft digital.com and say hey I have an idea here's what I'd love to see because uh, we are listening and we are paying attention to the things you know Dan and Kevin and I are mostly the ones that are out in the community listening to authors but the entire team uh, is engaged and very interested in listening to um, what authors want. So if there's data you would love that would help you, tell us what it is. Uh, and that gets put into the, that gets put into the, the ongoing plan um, to make, to make it easier. And you are right, Lindsay. Yeah. Even if you're exclusive to Amazon, use the link because later on you can still use it. And, and you're taking advantage of the vanity renaming the link, right? So you put the book title in there too? No. no. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, I didn't on. even think about really? that so i so will I go say, ahead in the future yeah and it doesn't even have to be i mean i i put my traditionally published books in there so i can say go to books to read.com slash macabre montreal and and that's a traditionally published book go to books to read.com slash a canadian werewolf in new york and you can find a link to all retailers there so it's way easier than saying go to books to read.com slash v297 <coughs> right like whatever that url is um that's a huge benefit uh in my mind and it, i do a lot of radio programs as, as an author because i do ghost story stuff and so that comes in really really handy when the only medium is audio and you can't say oh check the show notes for a url <laughs> so that's very handy that way all right um you were saying earlier about like the way that you succeed at being wide is to be available in all the places uh, one of the, frequently the odd man out is uh, Google Play for all any number of reasons. They have they seem to be the only play, people who have wholesale pricing, and they have sort of on again, off again availability for new author signups. So, like, uh, is Google Play like as a result? Is Google Play potentially a growth opportunity? I know that books to read will scrape Google Play and put it up there. So, like, how should we be treating Google Play? Uh, I have been on Google Play for over ten years. Uh, I've, I've been on Google Play almost, I think, for 2007 or eight when they first opened up. Uh, I have made a total of, I think, $10 off of Google Play, and it's mostly been in the last 12 months. Um, so uh, for me, it's not a big deal. But considering who Google is and how they're one of the smartest tech companies in the world, if they applied 1% of their brain power, to this, they could change, uh, they could dramatically change the industry almost as powerfully as Kindle changed the industry for us in the authors. Like that's how I, I, I believe, I, I know uh, I've been to some of the Google offices in Toronto and Waterloo and amazing stuff going on, amazing people who work there. Um, if they applied just a little bit, they could get there. And I do know authors, I've met uh, tons of authors uh, that are doing really, really well on Google. So I think the only way I could ever do well on Google is first to get my books there. Okay, I haven't sold anything. And then the other thing, yeah, it is frustrating as maybe it's more frustrating for authors who sell a high enough volume that when Amazon price matches, they go, oh, I just lost $10,000 because they price matched my book. I don't have to worry about that yet. I would just go, oh good, I made some money off of Google, great. And I lost a couple hundred dollars off of Amazon from the sales, oh well. At least I'm growing my platform on other retailers. At least I'm finding re uh, readers on other platforms. I mean, they've got Android. They've got, you know, you've got you've got Apple, iOS, and Android. The two major. Everyone's got that, those computers in their pockets, one or the other. 
um, you know, and, and that's, that's 50%. Well, I'm, I don't know the stats, but, you know, half the people are walking around with an Android phone. The other half are walking well, in our house. I'm walking around with an iPhone and, and Liz is walking around with an Android. You know, she's going to migrate. Uh, well, she's a couple person for obvious reasons, but she's going to migrate to um, uh, Android uh, Google store by default because that's, that's the, the thing they have power over. So I'm also one of those people that have never really tinkered with draft to digital so I'm curious what you would say would be the pros and cons of draft to digital over smashwords well uh, I, I and I I never like to say anything negative about uh, uh, about uh, a company that I respect really really well and a person I respect I mean I, I've known Mark Coker for a long long time and I truly honestly think a lot of us should be extremely grateful to what he did he was there for indie authors at the very beginning and he created an amazing opportunity yeah I remember he pulled some favors for me so yeah I've had nothing yeah. bad to say about him yeah no amazing and a, and a guy who uh, his heart is right there with wanting to support authors and, and gotta love the community um Unfortunately, in some of the ways, and again, this is from my own experience, and I still and I still do publish through Smashwords, um, but I tend to to use Smashwords for some for Smashwords itself because there are people who buy my stuff through Smashwords. But then there's some a bunch of other retailers that you can't get to directly, or you can't get to through Drafted Digital or Publish Drive or some of the other uh, companies out there, Street Lib, etc. Um, I think one of the challenges I've always had is the um, uh, the conversion tool and the, and the meat, the meat grinder. I, I, I hate the fact that they use that word because that just is a negative connotation. You never want to see how the sausage is made. Um, but you know, you don't have to read a, a, a 20 word, uh, a 20 page document, uh, to understand how to format your word document. Um, like I said, when I was at Kobo, I was using, I was using draft to digital's free conversion tool and then taking that EPUB and publishing it to Kobo. Uh, I was doing that when I was inside. So obviously they have a really solid conversion tool and you can get a Mobi from there too. Um, I think, uh, the recognition of international pricing, uh, was, was key as well. And the other, the other key thing that I think is a, a something that I wish smash smashwords would fix is that you go to publish a book to smashwords and you have to publish it everywhere automatically. And then you have to go and remove it. So if you don't catch it in time, you're going to get, and I don't like messy metadata. On draft to digital you go in and you say, here are the stories I want to publish to. Because, you know, for, for me, I, I, I go direct to Kindle and obviously I, I, using Kobo Writing Life for some strange reason. Um, and I, I would by default go to Nook and to iBooks and to Tolino and a whole bunch of other places. Um, draft to digital remembers your favorite settings. And then when you go to publish your next book, it says, here's what you want. Do you want to change it? And for every single book, you can do that, which I, which I, I think is, it's time saving, it's angst saving. And at the end of the day, uh, any, any tool that can save an author the hassle, the worry, so that they can focus on what's important, going back to their family, the life they like, and even writing the next book, because I'm assuming they like that too, uh, and to take, take it away from all those mundane tasks. Uh, those, those are kind of important. Uh, at the end of the day though, uh, even as a draft to digital rep, I honestly believe that authors need to make a decision that's uh, best for them. Uh, and there's pros and cons for every single distributor. There's pros and cons for direct or not direct. Um, and everyone has to make a decision based on what they're comfortable with and how much time they want to spend doing things. You know, you can go directly to every single place. You can do all of these things. Um, how do you want to spend your time and how do you want to spend your energy? Uh, some of the authors I work with, for example, professional speakers, because I'm part of a guild here in Canada. And a lot of them are just, no, I just want a single place where I go and push a button once I'm done. I don't want to have to log in 16 times and change my price 16 times because of, whoops, I forgot to do it on Google. Uh Oh, I'm toast now. Right. So sometimes that, um, the convenience, right? Why is Uber so powerful for us? Uh, I can walk out the door. I can see where the car is. I get into the vehicle. I get to the, my, my location. I get out. I don't have to pull my credit card out and swipe it and do whatever. It's all taken care of. And if I want to tip the driver, I push a button and I tip the driver. Um, so I think tools uh, and opportunities for authors that make it convenient for us to do the things that we want to do, sell more books and write more books, ideally. Um, those are the things that are going to win in the long run.
It sounds like Draft of Digital has been quite busy this last year or two. I think it's been maybe two years since we had Dan Wood on. And I, I believe you guys just started with doing print formatting. So yeah, is that pretty easy? You just upload a Word file and uh, here's, yeah, a, here's yeah. <laughs> a novel, here's a book, paperback. Yeah, so I mean, this is, a, this is an example of a book that I did. Uh, I, I know it's an audio uh, podcast, but uh, what I did is even though I can format in InDesign and I can do all the design because I've done it since 2004 when I first did a print-on-demand book, what you can do is you upload your front cover and you upload your Word document, and then you can pick from, you know, the list of templates that draft digital has always had for PDF, so you can just create a PDF, and they had had it there so you could download it and then just go load it uh, somewhere else. Um, what, uh, what I did is to test out the system, um, because I'm, I'm one of the beta users, because it, it hasn't uh, been launched wide yet, is I went in, I put in my Word document, I picked the template, and then I formatted it from draft uh, to digital. Um, the benefit is, is the back cover was generated automatically for me. So I didn't have to do a full cover flat and then I could upload my author photo and I could manipulate the text. So I think for the author who already has a designer who's doing full cover flats and stuff like that, you know, the advantage is, yeah, there's a place you can distribute your uh, PDF for free to, to, to go wide. So if you didn't want to do it through Ingram Spark, for example, you have an option to just do it through Draft to Digital. You know, you push your audiobook to find away voices. You save the $49 uh, finder's fee for uh, for finding uh, talent to work on uh, on the title, and you and you maybe use that to to distribute your your PDF uh, your POD uh, file wide. Um, for authors who already have that, they could just upload their their professionally designed front cover and interior, and I've done both. Um, and, and I've only seen the sample for one, but I have the other ones coming. Uh, I, I think that's pretty exciting. Uh, again, it's meant to be a convenience tool for authors who may not even have the ability to do that. So uh, you've probably got cover designs for your entire uh, flats because you've had to do that, right? But what about a, a new author who's never even thought that was a possibility. Suddenly there's a tool there that they never had access to before, or they would have had to spend three to $500 or something to get a designer to do something for them. So I love a tool that is flexible enough that somebody, it removes that barrier for, for, for the author. And, and I love that because when you remove barriers, people find inventive ways to make that successful. Uh, that's good that that's out there because I know it, there's been a couple of times in the past, I do have my regular designer, they just will do an upgrade, you know, for a little more, they do the paperback version too. And that's nice because you, they'll wrap around the artwork and that kind of thing. But I've had a couple of times in the past where I had like the ebook cover made and I didn't know I was going to put it in print or whatever it was. And I ended up going to create space and I don't know for 125 or something, they would do it. And now they're gone. <laughs> so yeah. it's like, who are you going to go to if, you know, you, if you don't have somebody that it, you knew we were doing it kind of on a shoestring. So it's good that that's an option. Now, I think I heard, I don't remember who was saying it. I think maybe the Sell More Book Show mentioned that you guys are doing kind of a Kindle Worlds replacement. And as somebody who had a Kindle Worlds and the authors were in it for only a year before they were like, hey, well, okay, thanks for writing that whole novel for that world. It's, it's gone now. Um, yeah. I'd love to hear about <laughs> what you guys are doing there. Yeah. So, I mean, just like, you know, it's uh, so D to D print is the, uh, is the print on the end one. This is uh, D to D universes. And so the idea is unlike Kindle Unlimited, you're not required to be exclusive to one retailer. It can be wide open. I think some of the key things are for those who were having a successful time in universes, it was great. It's also great for those who want to open up their universes where they, they know there's a world that other people can play in and they want people to play in it. Uh, there's an opportunity there that, uh, again, when you create opportunity, uh, creative people will find inventive ways to make it fun and successful. So it's a great way for authors to uh, invest in their universes and, uh, and, and participate in that. I think one of the key uh, things that's coming out of uh, D2D universes that's going to be coming very, very soon is the ability for payment splitting. So when you collaborate with an author, even if you're just publishing a single book, the payment splitting option will allow you the ability, right? So we have to build that technology in. So we have to have the technology to say, all right, so the three of you have written the, the science fiction and fantasy, uh, the best of the podcast book. And you've just, you know, your notes on the whatever, how do you split that? 
someone has to sign up for an account everywhere and then get the money and then have to divide the money up. Well, d to d Universes has forced us to create a tool that says, no, 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 we have to do payment splitting. We have to be able to say, Lindsay gets this, Joe gets this, Jeff gets this, and you guys decide how you're going to split that up. And I'm really, really excited about that because think about all the great platforms out there and the Kindles and the Kobos and Nooks and Apples of the world that doesn't really exist in any way, shape, or form. You know, Bundle Rabbit has it. Uh, that's the only platform that's used it. But how many authors are using that platform? As much as I love it, I think it's great. Imagine having that, um, f- you know, in, in, in a significant way, either for allowing people to write in your universe or just even for wanting to publish collaboratively. You suddenly don't have to say, well, what happens if Lindsay gets hit by a truck and she's in a coma and Joe and Jeff are waiting for their payment, but she can't do anything? No, you know what I mean? Like, not that you ever should get hit by a truck, but those are the kinds of things that can happen uh, even when you completely trust the other person. Um, There's still uh, the weird things that happen where, you know, so something happens with your bank and suddenly you can't get the money out or whatever. Uh, So I I love that idea of of that control it's going to give to authors. And I can't wait until that's actually uh, implemented. Again, we will not implement something where uh, our beta users are finding enough bugs that it's going to cause more pain than it's going to help. And that's always a real real challenge is just waiting until it's uh, ready for prime time. Yeah, I would, I'm definitely going to be watching because I'm curious. I've, you know, we've had a lot of people have a great deal of success doing the collaborations, but at that point you basically become a publisher and you've got a lot of work on your table editing and overseeing things that are not you writing new books. And if you're like an introvert and, and just don't want to deal with handing out the money and all that's involved, it would be nice to say, but maybe you're, you're done writing in a world. You did your series, but there's lots of more stories that could be told. I guess I could see putting it out there and just maybe inviting certain authors. Do you know, uh, I assume they'll have to go through draft to digital and like the original author would have to have their books through draft to digital to kind of make everything work. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, I think we're still figuring out uh, the mechanics of that. I do know that right now we don't yet have the ability for, uh, connecting to authors. So if somebody says, oh, could you introduce me to Lindsay Broker? I want to do that. We, 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 you know, in, in protection of privacy and stuff like that, we're not making any of those introductions. So right now you have to connect with the author directly and work it out. And then you guys can do what you want to do. Um, yeah, obviously um, uh, you, the way to get paid is coming through that system. So therefore it's going to have to uh, you know, but the, the the brilliant part there is you're not limited to only publish to one retailer. You can publish to all the retailers, um, and it allows you a conduit to control that universe uh, and say, yes, I, yeah, you know, Joe, you can write in this universe that I'm not. It, yeah, especially if you don't want to write in it anymore, right? That's a, a a way for the fans to still enjoy it, but you can move on to the next thing, which I think is is kind of a great thing. So none of us have to be Paul Sheldon not wanting to write another misery novel and then get captured and hobbled right we can let them write in the misery universe while we move on to write other things so everyone gets to win in a situation like that yeah uh, so, so one thing i think about a lot with this is like Lindsay was involved in kindle worlds and unfortunately discovered that she was involved toward the end of kindle worlds uh would you say that it's worth like is this the sort of thing that that writers should get in on as quickly as they can? Like, it, is there benefit to beginning getting in there early and being one of those inaugural authors? And should you create a project specifically for something like uh, like D two D universes? I mean, not unless you've had something burning that you've been dying to do, and it's just a thing you have to write and you want to do, and you right. I wouldn't say, oh, hey, there's a market trend. I'm going to go and write this because I think it's going to be successful. If it's not something you're truly passionate about or you're truly willing to commit to, I wouldn't worry about it. I would say, look at it and say, oh, my God, through a tool like this, I can now collaborate with other people. And there's a great collaboration tool. Um, Or, wow, I've always wanted to write in this universe. Yeah. Yeah. I meet so-and-so at the conference next year and say, oh, I'd love to write a story in your universe. And that opportunity is now there, right? So I wouldn't rush into it. Um, just like I wouldn't go and rush into to, you know, writing any project that you're not going to be committed to and actually 
truly believe in because you know if it sells great you're making money and everyone's happy but if it doesn't sell did you at least create something that you can be proud of or something that you're happy you you spent that much amount of time uh creating um so let that be your guiding factor rather than oh man i want to be the first one in on this because again it'll, it, it'll be it'll be around for a while yeah, you might want to wait to see how your series or universe does before you try to recruit all these people to write into it because they, you know, they're going to want it to be semi-popular so they can make some money if they're going to be giving away 25% or whatever it ends up being. All right, well, I guess we've been chatting for quite a while here, so we better let you go. Um, since it's the end of the year, I'm going to ask you a bonus question for closing. What are you excited for in 2019 for authors? And do you have any predictions about anything cool coming along? <laughs> uh, I am continually inspired by the unique types of collaborations uh, that exist for authors. Um, I know the growth, I'm, I'm, I'm excited about the continued growth in audio, uh, especially because more people have access to read when they're doing other things, even if they don't read walking the dog, doing the dishes, going for a run, whatever. I'm really excited about the opportunity for storytellers to work in fields that aren't traditional storytelling. You know, we've moved from print to reading on, on digital devices to listening on digital devices. There's still opportunities for indie authors that haven't been tapped into that involve storytelling for games. And I'm not just talking about video games. I'm talking about tabletop games, I'm talking about card games. You know, there was a the position for Cards for Humanities, a writer. Yeah, there's more opportunities for writers coming in 2019 that we can even imagine. Uh, and I'm so excited um, that if you are a storyteller, if, if your goal is to share and create stories, there will be new opportunities coming. Keep with it. Keep working on what you're working on. Uh, even if it's not working out right now, there's probably something coming down the line that's going to fall perfectly in line uh, with what you're the most passionate about. All right. I'll be looking for Cards Against Humanity, the novel, <laughs> which will be very <laughs> X-rated, I'm guessing. <laughs> Speaking of bleeping out words and such. But um, no, that is great. And we really appreciate you talking to us, Mark. You're always great to have on the show. Where is the best place for people to find you now? And is there any, do you have any new horror out that you managed to get done this last year? I did uh, Macabre Montreal, uh, which is a nonfiction true ghost story. Uh, Co-written with Shani Krishnasamy, who's actually at Kobo. <laughs> we used to be colleagues. We got to work together for a little while longer after I left. Uh, and then I've got the Nocturnal Screams uh, series of, of short fiction that I've just been publishing uh, wide. Um, you can find me at marklesley.ca. If you reach out to me there, you can connect with me through draft to digital as well. I'm more than happy to answer your questions and, and of course, check out, um, check out the blog at draft digital.com to keep uh, abreast with all of the exciting new developments that we're going to be sharing with authors in the forthcoming year. All awesome. Right. Sounds good. Thank you very much. And thank you for listening, everyone. All right. Thanks for hanging out with us again. So long everybody. <laughs>